Aw, man, here we go again. From the Raimi cut to the Watiti cut. We need to see both these things because the actual movies aren't clearly aren't as good as they could have been. So yes, I'd heard from my sources a while ago that there was a four-hour cut of Thor Love and Thunder, which was due to a ton of improvisation while shooting. So Marvel, I heard, really struggled to get that down to under two hours for theatrical release. If you watch the offer on Paramount+, Plus, uh, they have a really good discussion in one of the episodes about the importance of you know, a, a short runtime because it gets more screenings. Uh, but then also they do the great counter argument of, well, a longer, better movie is great, just book more screens. And I think clearly, while they're going with the business route, this is one point where I, this is one time where I really strongly side with the artists. But in a, because in a recent interview to hear Taika Waititi and Chris Hemsworth's side of the story, they revealed the existence of the four hour cut, so it's official. And they described it as very Monty Python-esque, very exploratory. And that got me very excited, having seen what remains of that four hour cut. I'm like, oh, that makes so much sense. I wish I could see that movie. Uh, much better than what we get. And this is now two auteur directors with two very distinct styles crammed into the commercial box that is a Marvel movie. Because uh, this, just like Doctor Strange 2, seems more like a clip reel of a much better movie. And it's clear when you watch it that there's a lot missing. They didn't hide it. You're not like, oh, this, this movie turned out great. You're like, where's the rest of it? <laughs> I mean, they're releasing more of Spider-Man. I mean, come on, Marvel. Give us these, the Raimi and the Watiti cut. I know the, Sam Raimi's been a very good team sport and said he's very happy with the film as is, but that couldn't possibly be true. All right, so anyway. Now, one thing that Doctor Strange 2 has as a benefit is that while it's very far afield from the comic book source material, besides revilifying Wanda, which we also took issue with because of all the work that Wanda, WandaVision did, uh, and I guess Thor benefits from that a little bit. You know, it hasn't had any series to take a deeper dive and then make the movie seem, you know, shallow in comparison. Uh, but anyway, the Wanda comic book stories were not Wanda-centric. She was like a, a side character. She was more of a catalyst than an actual character in these stories. So you wanted to, you wanted to see them changed. But Thor Love and Thunder adapts two of the best Thor stories ever told, Gore the God Butcher and Jane Foster as the Mighty Thor. And what's here resembles those two storylines just enough that it hurts to see those iconic stories whittled down so much. You're like, wow, I should help people go read the trade paperbacks that this movie is based on, because that's much better. But all that said, I like Thor Love and Thunder much better than Doctor Strange 2. This is a movie I, want, I would want to watch again. We will do a watch along. And uh, if it's not too crowded when it drops on, uh, on Disney Plus. But I, I would definitely watch this movie again. And here is why. The movie is so funny and clever. I mean, you will, you will laugh throughout the entire film. I, my, and it was great to be in an, with an audience in that regard because we were all laughing together. It was so funny. And that will distract you from what's wrong with it. All this stuff will distract you with, from what's wrong with it. The film is also genuinely brilliant and moving at moments. And it's these two qualities, by the way, the funny and the brilliant, that make me really want to see that Monty Python cut. I'm like, let's go for a, a stroll. Let's go for a walkabout through Taika Waititi's version of Thor. I would be very interested in that. Because uh, there are moments here that are just unparalleled in terms of quality. There are also a lot of great set pieces. Uh, a quick tour of New Asgard, which has become a theme park, basically. Build a Disney or make an extension of Avengers Campus. Uh, amazing intricate visuals from the city of the gods to the black and white battle with gore, with, you know, splashes of color and other stuff that I won't spoil. My only problem with the visuals, though, is that sometimes it got very green screening, especially that gore fight. You were like, I know you're all standing in front of a green screen. You're not fooling nobody. All right, the, uh, I have bad grammar like gore. <laughs> all right. I was like, learn grammar, gore. All right, that's, <laughs> that kind of works with his name. All right, the ending is amazing. Now, no spoilers, but let's just say, while Gore and Jane are kind of, a, 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 kind of wasted, Jane in particular, the story of Thor and New Asgard gets such thrilling, unexpected developments that it makes you super excited for what's gonna come next. I mean, you're like, wow, this is like kind of like a middle chapter a little bit to Taika Waititi's trilogy. So you're like, I can't wait for chapter three. 
Also, one of those changes is very bold. And in fact, while I saw it unfold in the movie, I was like, what's happening? I don't know how to feel about this, but it's resonated with me. And I think I really respect Taika Waititi for going there and for Marvel letting him. And we will talk about that stuff in spoiler coverage. And then there are two wonderful performances at the heart of this film. Instead of continuing to try to play the classic idea of Thor, which did not work out, Chris Hemsworth, thanks to partnering with Taika Waititi and showing the world how funny he was in Ghostbusters. Some of you might hate Ghostbusters, but it gave us funny Chris Hemsworth. But anyway, he has instead gifted Thor with his own best qualities. Hemsworth's Thor is truly an Australian surfer guy, just with a different accent. This Thor is so funny, so energetic, but also so kind and open. This Thor says yes to life and to those around him, and it makes him just a joy to be around. Getting to spend two hours with him is an absolute treat. I could just spend forever with Chris Hemsworth Thor. I think he's just that good. And he's got a lot of movies left in him as far as I'm concerned. And then there's Christian Bale's gore. Wow, his origin story shown in about a 10 minute scene. I don't wanna say anything else. But it hits so hard, it's incredible. Again, I was like, Marvel, I can't believe you let Taika Waititi do this. I love it. To see such a wide range of deep emotions play out across Christian Bale's face. I mean, he takes face acting to a whole new level. I've never seen such good face acting. I was in awe. He's also quite funny in the film, and we don't usually get to see funny Christian Bale, so I really appreciated that. Although, unfortunately, Gore suffers not only from a lack of screen time, what? I know, it's ridiculous, but all the problems of a traditional MCU villain. And it is absolutely ridiculous that with their 29th film, Marvel has still not solved its villain problem, I guess with kind of the exception of Thanos. Ridiculous. Visually, though, he's as fun to watch as Cate Blanchett's Hela. Excellent. Excellent. I can't wait to see what, what celebrated Oscar-winning actor Taika Waititi convinces to play the villain in the next movie. Although there are some hints to that. I don't know. I, I guess he kind of... Oh, okay. No spoilers. Ha <laughs> ha. I love it. Russell Crowe as Zeus is also inspired. And he's clearly having a really good time here. Taika Waititi must be a lot of fun to work with. He brings out the best in his actors. Even if it does result in a four-hour cut. I don't care. I will watch that. Uh, I would like to take a moment here also to note that Thor Love and Thunder is very adult. There's talk of orgies, like they don't just mention it once, they, talk, they bring it up a couple of times, uh, very clearly. Uh, there's the fully nude Hemsworth, as you've seen in the trailer, but you know, they dwell on that. You know, they don't show any other angles, but you know, it's like more than just a moment. And also some discussion as to how babies are made. Now, it's alien babies, sure, but it might bring up some questions that you might want to be prepared to answer after the movie. And again, there are two, two LGBT characters here with extended, very sweet discussions about their love lives. Although, again, I would hardly call this representation for 2022, as it's only talk or shown very briefly, like blink and you miss it. Forget a serious relationship. King Valkyrie doesn't even have a love interest. After all the promises that were made, what the heck, man? But speaking of King Valkyrie and Jane Foster, while it's clever to make them fast friends, Jane reminding Valkyrie of her fallen sisters, although again, done so quickly, they both come across here very poorly and really end up splitting what would be the screen time of a single female lead. So neither of them gets enough screen time. Taika Waititi isn't doing women any favors with this representation. In fact, I think he kind of hurts women in, the, in movies like this because both characters are kind of a bummer, especially next to Hemsworth and Bale. Tessa Thompson looks fantastic, but she's forced to play a character who doesn't like being king, even though she and all of us were so excited when she got the gig. We missed the fun part. We never got to see her enjoy it. So through most of this movie, she's unhappy and bored, and that's no fun, especially standing next to Thor, the god of the party bus. And it's too bad because in Ragnarok, Tessa Thompson's Valkyrie was a lot of fun. I mean, she was also bummed out, but uh, I guess kind of like in a fun way, she's just been turned more into a wet blanket, which I can understand is maybe Taika Waititi felt was character development, but you know, it just makes her less fun than Thor and, I, and that's not cool. And then Jane, oh. Natalie Portman is an Oscar-winning actress, and she has delivered some fantastic performances throughout her career, but they have not been in blockbuster movies. And V for Vendetta is a very different type of movie, and she wasn't the star there. She wasn't the one who was supposed to be the big person who delivered the action, right? I mean, when you think of her work in Star Wars and now this, she should stop trying to make this kind of movie. 
The flashback scenes as to why she and Thor broke up are actually quite moving. And it's great to see that Jane has become so successful. Portman is at her best here when she's playing the human side of Jane. But when she becomes the mighty Thor, you know what it's like? It's like when your good friend starts dating someone and now suddenly everyone in the friend group has to start spending time with that new person as well. Even though you didn't choose to date them, you're like, what? And Portman doesn't feel like Thor at all. Uh, she, uh, for another metaphor, she comes across as someone's girlfriend who insists she can easily do what her boyfriend does, only for reality to come smack colliding in her face. You know, that, there, that experience is actually a thing, and maybe her boyfriend just has a special set of skills, and she should appreciate the job that he does, rather than thinking that she could do it too. And I'm, I feel awful that I'm saying these things because I liked the character so much in the comics. But that has not translated at all. And I believe it's a mix of what Taika Waititi has chosen to do with the character and Natalie Portman's performance. For instance, in the comics, when Jane Foster was Thor, Odinson, that was his name, he couldn't be Thor anymore, was benched for the most part. And Jane was the Thor. Uh, she was Thor. And having them side by side, I got to tell you, it does not work. I'm actually reading the new Thor and Mighty, uh, and, and Mighty Thor comic. And there, too, Thor has been somehow taken off the table. And I got to tell you, it's pretty good. Uh, also, every conversation in the comics I see about Jane's relationship with Mjolnir and why she does what she does is like a billion times more interesting than anything that's explored in this movie. And so, again, I'm sorry to say it, but Natalie Portman's just really bad at this type of role. And as for you Guardians of the Galaxies fans, um, they're only in the movie for like five minutes, so uh, that didn't really turn into anything. Maybe they have more time in the four-hour cut. But you'll be laughing so hard, blown away, blown away by Hemsworth and Gore and the intricate, gorgeous visuals and captivated by what a slam-dunk ending of the movie and what it could potentially lead to next that you'll, you'll just gloss over most of this. I mean, when you do think of it, you'll be sad, but then you'll just think of the good parts of the movie and you'll just move on. Uh, I know we do that a lot lately with Marvel content and you know some, some of the Star Wars content too, but I don't know, this ends so strong, it's hard for me to be negative overall about the film. But I do think, Feige, that if you're gonna hire these auteur directors, let them auteur. Uh, so that's my non-spoiler review of Thor Love and Thunder, which hits theaters you know, this Friday in North America, but in some places even or so, even sooner. And stay tuned for plenty of spoiler coverage, because again, as I said, this movie does what's most important for a Marvel movie to do and why this franchise is so successful, and then it gets you really excited about what's next. All right, so share your thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.